this is the third in the series of free will and determinism. Um, I'm going to start out with David Hume and looking at the doctrine of necessity and the doctrine of liberty. Um, so we start out with the idea that free will seems to be a bit kind of problematic if we think that the universe behaves in a perfectly law-like matter, that everything is caused by something that happened before that, that happened before that, that happened before that, and that there's really uh, no deviation, you know, no possibility for deviation um, in the world of physical things, right? But, you know, somehow human beings, uh, we seem to be just as much mechanical, just as much a part of the world as everything else. Um, but we think that we are free to make decisions in the way that a, um, you know, a ball rolling downhill is not free to make decisions, right? There's a sense in which we could have done otherwise, perhaps. Um, that, you know, we could have chosen to, you know, try the different peanut butter today, um, that sort of thing. Okay, so starting with that idea, you know, upon deeper evaluation, we come up with the sort of three different perspectives, the hard determinists that say that the universe is determined, you're part of the universe, you're determined, the, that you think that you are freely making choices is illusory is just an illusion, get over it. <laughs> Libertarianism is the idea that either the universe is not determined and our will is not determined, or the universe is determined, but there's something unique to our will where it is somehow causally separate from the rest of the universe such that it can be truly free. We're going to look... Um, at a model of this when we come to Descartes' mind-body problem, which is the, the next thing we're going to, to do after uh, David Hume and the problem of free will. The compatibilism is the idea that the universe is determined. Um, our will may or may not be determined. Um, but what is really interesting isn't whether or not our, our will is somehow, you know, uncausally disconnected from the rest of the universe or not. That's a, a metaphysical problem that we, we can really never know with, with any degree of certainty. Um, so let's focus on the stuff that we can know and what's interesting to, to what we need to know, which is, uh, did you make the decision to do that, right? You know, is, are you acting freely on your own uh, will, or in accord with your will, we would say. So the doctrine of liberty is the idea that the universe, and again, to say that the universe is completely determined, to say that everything follows physical laws, you know, that, that is also uh, something that we don't have perfect knowledge about, right? It just seems to be the case that things that we've observed so far you know, follow these patterns. And uh, that may change in the future. Um, and it may even have been different in the past, and we just haven't figured out how to see it yet. So David Hume is a skeptic. He's somebody who wants to say that our knowledge is necessarily limited to what we can observe. And there's a lot of stuff that we can't observe. Okay. Um, you know, we can't observe whether or not our will is, is caused or, or not caused, for example. Um, and for David Hume, the universe seems to behave in a pretty law-like fashion. You know, that, that doesn't seem to, and, and in fact, human behavior seems to follow in a law-like fashion, right? Um, and he, he calls something the, the doctrine of necessity, which is where he talks about how we derive 
cause and effect from observing the constant conjunction of events, you know, that events are happening, you know, together, usually at the same place at the same time, you know, or one immediately before the other, one seems to precede the other every single time that a particular event takes place. And by observing these things and how they act together, um, we infer that one thing causes something else. Okay. Um, so to his mind, what we're seeing in the world is things seem to follow laws that, you know, the, the universe behaves in a law-like manner and we can, but we can't assert with absolute certainty that one thing causes something else the best we can really do is say well this thing always happens before that thing happens as far as we've been able to tell and we think this thing causes that thing and it's it's an inference so a lot of times when people are talking about free will the idea that the universe is uh, very law-like or determined or, or uh, follows physical laws seems to be um, antithetical or um, counter to the idea that we can have a truly free will. And David Hume says, well, not only, you know, does the doctrine of necessity, does this idea of the universe following these, these patterns, uh, not only does that not present a problem for you know, the possibility at least of being at liberty, we really need a law-like universe, right? We need things to behave in a, you know, expected pattern to be predictable and so forth for us to have meaningful free will, whether it is uh, the physical things in the universe around us or whether or not it is even other people. And he gives us the historical fact that, um, you know, people throughout time, throughout history, seem to have responded the same way emotionally to some of the same events that we do, that there's this consistency in human behavior and experience that, that uh, follows, seems to follow through time and history. Um, and, you know, when we interact with other people, we have reasonable expectations of how they're going to behave, right? We can predict fairly reasonably what it is they're they're going to do or say and and um so this regularity in the universe this this ongoing you know pattern following that one thing seems to necessarily follow something else this doesn't challenge our possibility of being um at least you know free enough <laughs> to sort of make decisions and in fact it's kind of required so we have this doctrine of necessity um, and then we're going to have the doctrine of liberty here we go let me just read this bit to you right here if we examine the operations of body and the production of effects from their causes we shall find that all our faculties can never carry us farther in our knowledge of this relation than barely to observe that particular objects are constantly conjoined together. And constantly conjoined together doesn't mean that they're attached to one another, but they, they, they occur together over and over again, you know, in, in terms of both proximity um, and time. And that the mind is carried by a customary transition from the appearance of one to the belief of the other. So people follow the doctrine of necessity in as much as they behave in a law-like fashion, fashion. When that doesn't prove true, according to Hume, it only shows that we've, we've missed some part of, you know, the, the, the cause for this particular uh, act or event. And I think he, you know, he gives the example of people uh, being cranky. Okay. All right. Not only is the universe deterministic, we expect determinism to work in our favor and in our interactions as well, because human behavior is not changed throughout history. 
human interactions are mostly predictable, and when they're not, we just don't know something. Okay, so we come up with David Hume's version of compatibilism. Even though the universe may be fully determined, um, free will in some capacity still exists. You know, there's, there's, we're just not, we're going to be kind of agnostic about, we're going to say that we don't know, but, you know, we, we seem to have, you know, free will enough. Um, this is also called soft determinism by William James. You might hear that if you go into other classes to uh, study some of these ideas. Allows us to settle issues of moral responsibility. Uh, David Hume points this out that um, the ongoing debate about free will and determinism, are we ultimately free or not free um, from you know the determinism of the universe? It doesn't tell us whether or not somebody should be held morally responsible for a particular act. If it is the case that the universe is determined and someone else's acts are determined, you know, and as a consequence of this, they, they, they you know, uh, shot the flower pot off the wall, then that person is still, you know, at least ostensibly morally responsible for that act in as much as anybody is. Um, and if it's the case that our will is, is uncaused, right, you know, that, that this person was truly free to have done otherwise, that, that the universe did not determine this to be the case, and they shot the flower pot off the wall, um, that they should be held morally accountable for it. Um, but the, the thing that we're interested in when it comes to whether or not people should be held accountable for what they do is whether or not they did the thing, right? Or whether or not they were acting on their will when they did it. Um, or were they forced to do it? Were they coerced into doing it? Did, was somebody being held hostage? Um, did someone, you know, have a hold of your hand and was jerking it around uh, so that you were, you were behaving involuntarily? So to the extent that our choice actions are determined by our choices, they are done freely period. So if you're able to act on your will, then you are free. As far as David Hume is concerned, whether or not your choices are completely free, that doesn't matter. That remains uninteresting and unknown and unknowable to Hume. To say that something causes something else means that, in our experience, the occurrence of the first thing is customarily followed by the occurrence of the second. To say that someone acts freely means simply that a person's action follows from choice or act of will. And, you know, in this way, the, the will is what kind of quote unquote, causes, right? You know, we have this constant conjunction of our will and intention and, you know, f uh, development of, of plan and so forth, um, giving rise to an act and in, in corresponding from that. And, and that would be um, a free action. We're not concerned about what causes the will. We're concerned about whether or not we can act on it. Okay, so, doctrine of liberty. Liberty is acting in accord with the will. We are not at liberty if we are being forced in some way to act against our will. And uh, David Hume refers to being physically restrained. Uh, he said, you know, tell me whether or not they are uh, in prison or in chains, but you can also be uh, restrained via coercion where someone has... Uh, talked you into doing something or threatened you or threatened something else. And coercion is sort of um, unfair persuasion where someone is using either an appeal to emotion or a threat to, to get you to do something um, as opposed to appealing to reason, which would be persuasion. 
but that wouldn't be constraint either, right? You know, persuasion, trying to convince you via reason, you're still free uh, in a sense. You're not, but uh, it's uh, not some, someone is not trying to take advantage of you. Okay. So that is the doctrine of liberty and the doctrine of necessity. Can you see how this works, right? You know, so we have this idea that maybe the universe is, you know, seems to behave in a very law-like fashion, right? We're going to be able to figure out where a ball's going to go when we throw it. You know, we can make predictions based on previous experience. Um, so there seems to be, you know, some control over that. Um, and it seems that simultaneously we are ourselves free to decide, you know, am I going to go for a walk? Am I going to eat an apple? Or am I going to get in the car and drive to Tijuana? These are, these are all things that we could do, um, free things. Uh, though, well, you know, presumably driving somewhere for, for an extended period of time is going to cost money of some sort. Anyway, um, I, I meant freedom as in liberty. Liberty is acting in accord with the will. Right. So we don't know whether or not our will is itself determined. And that seems to be the primary threat in the problem of free will. Um, how do we resolve that? David Hume has a way. Um, this is what many philosophers go with, which is, well, we don't know, you know, if our will is or is not itself determined. But what we do know is that for the most part, when we're interacting with each other in the world, we want to know, um, are you acting from your will when you make a decision, you know, when, when something happens? That's what we're really interested in. So we have, uh, so David Hume breaks it down to the doctrine of necessity. Um, sometimes I think of it as determinism light, you know, L-I-T-E, where we're talking about the universe behaving in a very law-like fashion, right? One, one thing causes something else, causes something else, you know, cause and effect, cause and effect chain, um, leading all the way back to the beginning of the universe. But the, uh, you know, the idea of necessity is that, well, we can't know that with absolute certainty, but it does seem to be the case that things, that the universe is pretty predictable and does behave, you know, in a way that, you know, we can infer, you know, looks like cause and effect for us. Um, Yeah, there's was thinking about pragmatism, but never mind. Um, and between that gives us the ability to be able to predict and have meaningful uh, decisions, meaningful liberty, right? Um, so because we can predict what's going on in the universe and more or less what other people are going to do with some... A degree of certainty. We know what our actions are going to do and we can predict their effects. And then we have the doctrine of liberty, which is where we are acting on our will. Okay, so free will and the problem of evil. Um, and this also brings in the theological problem of evil, or rather a problem of free will which is you know if god is all powerful um and has produced the entire universe and is all knowing um it would also seem to be contrary to us being able to have a truly free will you know that um god knows with 100 percent certainty what it is we're going to do um so are we are we really free when we do that? But there's a, a distinction between you know prediction and uh, predetermination. You know you can you can predict with with great accuracy you know what people are going to do, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're predetermined. There just might be uh, such sufficiently good reasons that they're they're not going to do something else. Um, so and we've encountered this idea before. Um, 
does, you know, that, that free will can resolve the problem of evil if you accept the idea that God has um, allowed us to be able to choose freely what it is we going, we're going to do and not going to do. And then we have the idea that the evil that exists in the world, the evil and suffering, is caused by the freedom of our will, that we bring it about. So it's not a problem of evil because God doesn't bring evil into the world. Human beings do. Um, and what was the other idea I was thinking about? Da, 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 da. And then there's the other idea that, um, again, so that we can have free will, um, so that we can have meaningful choices. We need to have the option to be able to not only do good things, but we need to do uh, have the capacity to do evil things as well. Otherwise, we're not really choosing, you know, and, and it, the, the choice becomes much less interesting. Um, and, you know, we don't have to even think about necessarily, you know, pure evil. We can also think about evil is turning away from God. And we have to have the ability to turn away from God so that if we turn towards God and follow God's edict, but we have the choice of not doing that, that makes our following God, our love of God, that much more meaningful. Okay. So Descartes has a resolution. This is the next thing we're going to look at. Um, this is called the mind-body problem. So if the mind does not obey physical laws, then there's no problem for free will. So he breaks the mind and the body into two different things, you know, two different substances. The res cognita, which are uh, things or thought things, and the res extensa, which are things that exist in the world. They possess extension, they have dimension. Um, I want you to think about, do, your, do thoughts have extension? Do they exist in the world in a way that they are, you know, maybe have mass? or uh, take up space. Um, this idea is going to wind up resolving uh, the issue of the freedom of the will, and it also preserves the possibility of the eternal soul existing independently of the body. But we'll, we'll look at that uh, more, I think, on Wednesday. Okay, this is from the cartoon uh, XKCD, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, go ahead and do so. I used to think the correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class. Now I don't. Sounds like the hel class helped. Well, maybe. And this is the interesting bit. This is the, this is uh, the mouse over text. Correlation doesn't imply causation, but it does waggle its eyebrows suggestively and gesture furtively while mouthing, look over there. And there's one more idea I want to get across to you. Um, right. Which is the idea of authenticity. You know, all this talk about whether or not we have free will or whether or not we're determined and the universe is so law-like and so on and so forth. Um, it's worth noting that we can do things, that we have the capacity as human beings to do things that are, you know, profound expressions of our will contrary to pressure that we're getting from other parts, you know, the, from, from, our, from our society, um, from the physical world, and so on. This is August Lahnmesser in 1936, the, the person who's, you know, here in this circle. Everyone else has their arm, they are all making a Nazi salute. What you can't see here is that, you know, over here someplace is Adolf Hitler, right? Uh, Adolf Hitler is off, off to your left here um, and is present at the birthing of a ship into the water or whatever they call that. Um, and out of all the people that are there, this, this man has chosen not to make a Nazi salute. He has kept his arms down. 
as you can imagine, there's tremendous social pressure on this individual to go along with the rest of the group and, and stick his arm out. But he believes that uh, Hitler and, and Nazism is wrong um, and refuses to participate. So we know who this person is. His name was August Lahnmesser. Um, he was in love with a woman that was, uh, he, it was determined by the, the local government was Jewish and that he couldn't marry her. And he said, that's nonsense. And, and, uh, actually visibly and physically, uh, opposed Nazism. Uh, that's a tremendous expression of free will in the face of probably literal threat. And it's worth remembering that we do have this capacity to rise above all the forces that are around us, whether they are other people or other things, to be able to exert our will and do something powerful, something contrary, resist uh, in the event of an addiction, um, we still have a, a great capaci capacity that's worth preserving. Um, I'm going to skip, 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 skip. And the very last one, uh, choose determinism because I thought it was funny. Okay, that's the end of this lecture. <clears throat> And uh, next time, we're going to take a look at René Descartes.